Now the settlers who have fled to Palestine, while in 1939 doors to other countries are closing. Behind them, the Haganah, the Jewish Defense Force. With illegal arms, they are determined to defend the right of all Jews to enter the Promised Land. The life of legendary liquor baron Samuel Bronfman was marked by a deep commitment to his nation and his Jewish heritage. In the aftermath of World War II, Bronfman played a crucial role in financing a secret purchase of Canadian weapons for the Haganah, a Zionist paramilitary organization created by the Jewish Agency, an activist branch of the World Zionist Organization who was fighting for Israel independence in Palestine. Despite the brief mention of this endeavor in his New York Times obituary, little is known about Bronfman's precise involvement in this transaction. However, according to Peter Newman's comprehensive book, The Bronfman Dynasty, Sam went further than just financing the arms purchase. In 1948, he personally underwrote life insurance policies for Canadian pilots who joined the Israeli forces in their fight for independence. A few years following the creation of Israel in 1951, Sam would once again answer his people's call to action, this time helping lead a similar secret arms purchase for the successor of the Haganah, the Israel Defense Force, IDF. Bronfman was personally approached by Shimon Perez, one of Israel's founding fathers, to negotiate the transfer of $2 million worth of weapons from Canada to Israel. Bronfman would not only negotiate the deal, but also raised the funds to cover the entire cost of the significant arms cash. Sam, who was head of the Canadian Jewish Congress, kept quiet about his involvement in Zionist matters, despite his high-profile position, a characteristic example of the Bronfman family's quiet manipulation. Despite the lack of information about Bronfman's specific role, his connection to the Haganah was not uncommon among those in his social circle. Pro-Zionist activism was prevalent across Canada, America, Latin America, and beyond in the late 1940s, as the creation of Israel as a sovereign entity independent from British rule was at stake. When the British mandate ended in 1958, Israel immediately declared itself independent and entered into conflict with Palestine and coalition Arab forces. Israel is under attack from all fronts. The five nations of the Arab League, in defiance of the United Nations decision, have declared war on the Little Republic. Jerusalem is besieged. Supplies of food and water cut off by Transjordan's Arab Legion. The Haganah was a crucial player in laying the groundwork for this eventual formation of Israel, and the Jewish agency, under David Ben-Gurion's leadership, was responsible for creating numerous towns, villages, and defense groups in mandatory Palestine. David Ben-Gurion would later lead Israel as its first prime minister from 1955 to 1963 and would be revered as the father of the nation. Vital to the early success of the Haganah was the British military's role in training and arming them. Major General Or Charles Wingate, who had been dispatched to administer British control over the territory, even organized joint British Army Zionist paramilitary commando units. These units, dubbed the Special Night Squads, were tasked with patrolling and suppressing Arab elements in the region. It can also be noted that Major General Wingate also served and led Special Forces units in the Burma-China-India theater during the 1940s, a hotbed that birthed some of the most notorious but publicly obscure military and intelligence figures in history. By 1945, the Haganah had begun its efforts to stockpile weapons and supplies sourced from around the world. In the U.S., Ben-Gurion reached out to Rudolf Sonborn, a close associate and Zionist activist, to recruit a group of Jewish millionaires and billionaires to bankroll the supply effort. This led to the formation of the Sonborn Institute, a collaboration of Zionist millionaires and billionaires, which served as a model for the megagroup founded by Leslie Wexner and Charles Bronfman in 1991, a group that would have crucial ties to the rise of Jeffrey Epstein. The Sonborn Institute's main asset was Haganah operative Yehuda Arazi, who had extensive experience in smuggling arms for the Haganah into Palestine since 1938. Arazi utilized his impressive roster of contacts to set up front companies through which the Sonborn Institute and the Haganah could carry out their activities. These efforts played a crucial role in the eventual creation of Israel and the formation of the Israeli Defense Forces. Nahum Bernstein, 
an attorney based in New York City also organized various front companies that were used to acquire weapons as well as assemble them from spare parts. Surrounded by enemies, with her supply of arms cut off from almost every part of the world, Israel forges its own steel gauntlet for its strong right arm. The tanks and armored trucks start rolling from its own improvised assembly lines. Bernstein's name can be found on the corporate registration of firms like Machinery Processing and Converting Company, which provided cover for the purchase and the legal export of arms-making machines as well as armaments, and the Oved Trading Company, which supplied legal cover for the buying and transportation of explosives. During the 1940s and 1950s, a group of interrelated companies operated in the U.S., including Materials for Palestine, Inland Machinery, and the Eastern Development Corporation. Materials for Palestine was a charity set up as a means for fundraising money. Inland Machinery exported weapon components and weapon-making machinery disguised as legitimate machinery tools. Eastern Development Corporation was listed as exporting legal, non-military goods and machinery to Palestine, though it suggested that it may have had connections to organized crime and arms trading. OSS veteran Paul Heliwell, listed as the attorney for the similarly named Eastern Development Company, was rumored to have had connections to the corporation. According to a 1951 article in Miami News, Eastern Development Corporation was founded in Pittsburgh, but was operating in Florida. This would put the company in close proximity to Heliwell's center of operations at the time, and the two parties would also cross paths in a marina restaurant venture. While Paul Heliwell's involvement is speculative, well-known organized criminals such as Meyer Lansky, Bugsy Siegel, and Joseph Ziccarelli were involved in covertly arming the Haganah. Early on, Arazi formed ties with Lansky, requesting aid in maritime smuggling of arms to Zionist forces. Lansky contacted his associates, Albert Anastasia and Joe Adonis, both high-level players at the New York Docks and the Longshoremen Union. The trio then helped Israeli agents conceal the arms purchased for Israel while also mysteriously losing arms shipments bound for Egypt. Bugsy Siegel also provided financial support to the Haganah to the tune of $50,000 given over the course of several weeks in denominations of $5 and $10 bills. Joseph Bayon Joe Ziccarelli was a prominent figure in the arms trafficking network. According to the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, he was suspected of participating in the sale of arms and munitions to the government of Israel, among other countries like Cuba, Mexico, Venezuela, the Dominican Republic, and Nicaragua. Ziccarelli himself was close with Carmine Galante, a significant member of the Bonanno Mafia family, who later became one of Roy Cohn's criminal clients. Ziccarelli was in high demand, with both Charles Torin of the Genovese family and Carmine Galante vying for his loyalty. Galante eventually won, and under his influence, Ziccarelli's arms trade flourished. In the 1950s, he was sent to Montreal to work with Canadian mobster Vincenzo Catroni to import large amounts of heroin as part of the Canadian branch of the French Connection. Ziccarelli was also reportedly in business with Louis Rosenstiel, with Rosenstiel's fourth wife, Susan Kaufman, testifying that Ziccarelli was a secret partner in New Jersey warehouses owned by Shenley Industries. Kaufman also stated that Rosenstiel had meetings with Ziccarelli and Meyer Lansky. The connection to Shenley Industries highlights Ziccarelli's tendency to get involved in businesses that acted as both legitimate profit makers and fronts for illegal activities. Another one of these businesses was Abco Vending a cigarette vending machine company controlled by Ziccarelli and Galante, which was joined by Erwin Steve Schwartz. Schwartz would later become infamous for his involvement in costly stock manipulation schemes in the 1970s. According to FBN files, Schwartz represented the Galante-Ziccarelli interest in arms traffic, promotion and sale of worthless stocks and securities, and the cigarette vending business. The FBN also notes that since 1946, Schwartz had been engaged in arms trafficking with a portion of the arms obtained from communist bloc nations to be shipped to Israel and later Cuba. Ziccarelli, Schwartz, and Galante were also associated with Irving Schindler and Adolf Schwimmer in these ventures. Adolf Al Schwimmer was a visionary entrepreneur who went on to found Israel Aircraft Industries, today known as Israel Aerospace Industries. Throughout his career, Al served in various capacities, including with Lockheed and TWA, and with the U.S. Air Transport Command during World War II. Schwimmer also appeared in many Cold War-era covert operations. Perhaps most notorious among these, 
being his involvement on the Israeli side of the Iran-Contra affair. By some accounts, it was Schwimmer himself who conceived of the arms for hostages scheme that was at the heart of the scandal. Schwimmer's Israel Aerospace Industries would later come under the ownership of Israel's wealthiest man, Shaul Eisenberg, developing deep ties to Israeli intelligence with most of its senior staff coming from the intelligence community. During the 1940s, Al also worked closely with Irvin Swifty Schindler, the owner of an air freight company named Service Air. Al relocated the company to California with funds from the Haganah and used it as a means of acquiring aircraft and parts to be shipped to Palestine. However, due to U.S. embargo, Service Air was banned from sending these items overseas. Al and Schindler, aided by Arazi, then turned to their Haganah contacts in Panama and successfully transferred the legal ownership of the aircraft to a newly established Panamanian airline, Lapso, allowing the aircraft to be flown to Panama and then moved abroad. This collaboration marked the beginning of Israel's close relationship with Panama. Similar connections were formed with other countries in the region, including Nicaragua, with a particularly important relationship developing between the Haganah and the Somoza regime. The special relationship between the Zionist cause and the Somoza regime in Nicaragua was largely due to the heavy presence of United Fruit, a New York-Boston banana trading company with close ties to the CIA. This company was backed by Samuel Zamori, a strong supporter of Zionist causes who helped supply arms to the Haganah and acquire the SS Exodus in 1946. Zamuri's previous business ventures were also favored among major Wall Street firms such as Goldman Sachs and Lehman Brothers. By 1947, Nicaragua began providing arms to the Haganah, with Somoza reportedly receiving a 3.5% commission on all arms purchases made by the Haganah under Nicaraguan aegis. A decade later, Israel's emerging military-industrial complex, under the leadership of Shimon Perez, became the primary supplier of weapons for Nicaragua. Israel was also active in arming and training the Nicaraguan Contras, the U.S.-backed forces that opposed the Sandinista government that had toppled the Somoza regime in the late 1970s. This history of collaboration played a key role in the Reagan administration's propaganda campaign against the Sandinista government, which was portrayed as violently anti-Semitic. The Haganah's relationship with Latin America was not limited to United Fruit and its backers. Whitney Webb alleges they also called upon the services of Sam Kay, a Florida businessman with extensive contacts in Panama, Cuba, and elsewhere. FBI files allegedly describe Kay as a reputed international gangster with close ties to organized crime figures, including Meyer Lansky and Santo Traficante. However, in my search, I could not find the files to corroborate this claim. Sam K. aside, these connections mark the point where the interests of the Zionist movement converged with organized crimes, real estate ventures, casino operations, and slush funds in the Caribbean. Over time, these connections would grow into a truly intercontinental network. During World War II, Tibor Rosenbaum became known as a hero among the Jewish resistance for his daring rescues. Operating under the alias Istvan Lukacs, Rosenbaum executed a series of Mission Impossible-style rescues, at one point going so far as to infiltrate a concentration camp by impersonating a Nazi officer and using administrative pretext as a means to secure the release of 30 Jewish prisoners. However, his subsequent activities would be less than heroic. Rosenbaum used his position as a delegate for the World Zionist Congress to secure high-level connections and establish his Geneva-based bank, the International Credit Bank, ICB. The ICB was used to transfer funds for both Mossad and Israel's Ministry of Defense, with the British Sunday Times reporting in 1975 that as much as 90% of Israel Defense Ministry's external budget flowed through Rosenbaum's bank. The ICB was also involved in moving money for organized crime. In 1967, a report in Life magazine fingered the bank as the recipient of significant funds from mob-owned casinos in Las Vegas, the Caribbean, and other locations. This money laundering operation was overseen by banking institutions controlled by Meyer Lansky frontmen, with casino profits, drug trade profits, and other criminal proceeds being transferred to offshore banks such as the Bank of World Commerce, BWC, and Atlas Bank. Atlas Bank was also a subsidiary of Rosenbaum's ICB. 
These funds were then moved to ICB accounts in Geneva, converted into above-board loans and investments, effectively laundering the dirty money. It is worth noting that some of these funds may have been used to finance real estate investments made by individuals connected to American and Israeli intelligence. The organized criminal network associated with Atlas Bank was extensive and far-reaching. Sylvain Ferdman, a Swiss citizen and international banker and economist, was the organizer of Atlas on behalf of ICB. Ferdman would be marked as a fugitive by U.S. authorities for interfering with a federal inquiry into a skimming racket and also worked alongside some of Meyer Lansky's closest allies, including Ed Levinson and John Pullman. Levinson, a partner of Meyer Lansky in the Miami International Airport Hotel, ran the mob-controlled Fremont Hotel Casino in Las Vegas and had close ties with Clifford Jones, the former lieutenant governor of Nevada. Clifford himself was suspected of being associated with Meyer Lansky, though he would deny these allegations when put on trial during the Kafava hearings. John Pullman, Meyer Lansky's personal financial advisor, was at the time organizing the Bank of World Commerce, the partner to Atlas Bank and correspondent bank to ICB. Pullman was also responsible for introducing Lansky to Canadian businessman Lou Chesler, who subsequently helped manage Lansky's interest in the Bahamas, including hotel and casino developments. In addition to serving on the board of ICB, Levinson and Pullman also sat on the board of the Bank of World Commerce, which was established to provide a liquid supply of funds for new gambling casinos in the Caribbean. The two were joined by notorious mobster and Lansky money courier Benjamin Bugsy Siegel, who himself held positions at the Exchange and Investment Bank in Geneva. According to R.T. Naylor's book, Hot Money and the Politics of Debt, the Exchange and Investment Bank was Lansky's preferred financial institution until his role was accidentally exposed by Chase Manhattan, leading Lansky to shift the majority of his business to Rosenbaum's ICB. In addition to his Geneva banking, Bugsy Siegel was involved in Florida real estate and backed Major Realty, a large Florida landowner, which had been co-founded in part by Florida entrepreneur Max Orovitz. According to Jonathan Marshall, Orovitz was a legitimate businessman and an honored Jewish philanthropist, but was no stranger to organized crime. Orovitz had been part of the Miami Group, a circle of organized crime linked to Jewish businessmen with holdings in various economic sectors in Florida and Israel. Members of the Miami Group established Dan Hotels and Israel Oil Ventures. Israel Oil Ventures expanded significantly in the 1960s with the purchase of Israel American Oil Corp, which was linked to organized crime via Rimrock Thailands. This connection can be seen through Rimrock International, a subsidiary of Rimrock Tidelands that was of interest to a Senate investigation into international narcotics traffic due to its managing director, Santo Sorge, who was described by the Senate report as one of the most important mafia leaders, as well as a liaison between the American and Sicilian mafia clans. Compared to other dark money conduits, Atlas Bank, later renamed Atlas Trust, remains shrouded in mystery. It was not only tied to Geneva-bound money flows, but also hot money from the Middle East. According to Alan Block, Atlas was connected in some way to Intrabank in Beirut, Lebanon, which maintained an offshore entity in the Bahamas called Intra Bahamas Trust Limited. Intrabank had been established in 1951 by Youssef Betis, a Palestinian Christian from a renowned banking family. Within a decade, what started as a small operation grew into a massive empire, with Betis forming partnerships with prominent American banks, including Bank of America and Chase Manhattan, as well as opening branches in key locations for money laundering, such as London, Geneva, and the Caribbean. Intrabank held a significant presence in Lebanon, controlling 20% of the country's total deposits and 56% of all banking assets. Intra also held close ties to illicit activities of all kinds, including the services of smugglers, and it was a leading repository for the world's leading arms traffickers. Wealthy Arabs looking for a safe place to keep their petrodollars also added to the bank's deposits. Life magazine noted in 1967, 
Lebanon was prized as a haven for hiding cash by U.S. tax evaders, oil-rich sheiks, and criminals from around the world. The CIA saw the favorable environment of intrabank as an opportunity, and the bank played a crucial role in transforming Beirut into a hub for the agency's covert operations in the Middle East. Betis had a personal relationship with the CIA and was known to handle the agency's checks himself. Kamal Adham, the head of Saudi intelligence and a cousin of arms dealer Adnan Khashoggi, sat on the bank's board of directors. Adham was later implicated in several covert activities, including Iran-Contra and the BCCI affair. According to a congressional report, Adham was the CIA's principal liaison for the entire Middle East from the mid-1960s through 1979. Intrabank was also linked to the global drug trade, with American law enforcement identifying it as a major source of laundering and funding. A large portion of the bank's activities were based in Lebanon, a country that was a key node in the French connection, as well as the international drug trade. This node was largely controlled by Sami Khoury and his partner Omar Makoic, their ties to the Lebanese political establishment and law enforcement community had earned Curie the nickname The Untouchable. Curie had also expanded his reach overseas, with Corsican organized crime figures allied with him having connections to the highest levels of the French government, police, and military. Israel also protected Curie, and according to FBN agent James Adi, he had provided thousands of guns to the country and received assistance in moving narcotics across Europe. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics also implicated Edmond Safra in the flow of drugs from Lebanon to Europe. Safra had ties to BCCI, Iran-Contra, Robert Maxwell, and Jeffrey Epstein, and was also a Zionist with strong connections to Israel. During the 1980s, he served on the board of overseers of Benai Barith International, alongside figures such as Max Fisher and Edgar M. Bronfman, one of Samuel Bronfman's sons. One of Intrabank's most lucrative holdings was the Casino du Liban. Casino du Liban was not just any gambling establishment, but a hub of international activity, attracting high-profile elites and individuals from the underworld. It was a favored destination for wealthy Arab businessmen, such as Adnan Khashoggi, as well as foreign diplomats and spies. At its peak, the casino was said to be the largest gambling emporium in the world, outpacing even the likes of the Sands, the Dunes, the Flamingo, and the Monte Carlo. The gambling concessions at the Casino du Liban were held by Marcel Francisci, the leader of the Corsican underworld, who had forged close ties with Sam Curie and other international gangsters. Francisci, known as Mr. Heroin by American authorities, played a significant role in maintaining the French Connection drug pipeline. He was also a partner with notorious organized crime figure Meyer Lansky, who was known to frequent the Casino du Liban. Intrabank's peculiarities make sense when considering the amount of money to be made when a marriage between banks and organized crime occurs. Indeed, Intra was founded by an individual who had fled Haganah activities in Palestine and was seen as an attractive option for the CIA due to its operating environment. Yet, at the same time, Zionist gangsters, bankers, and other high-level figures were caught in its far-reaching web. This intermingling of contradictory factions, Arabs and Jews, gangsters and bankers, intelligence operatives and black market figures would become indicative of a trend that would become more prominent in the 1970s and 1980s. This complex and ever-shifting environment was a breeding ground for individuals of all types, many of whom were interlinked with the command structures of Western and sometimes Eastern intelligence services. The alignment between the ruling elites of Arab societies enriched by the petrodollar and the Israeli business and intelligence figures was of great interest to the U.S., which often found itself serving as a mediator between the two sides and using that role to further its attempts to dominate the Middle East. As the director of the CIA during President Ronald Reagan's tenure, William Casey sparked controversy by operating an informal intelligence network composed of his close friends and associates. This group, nicknamed the Hardy Boys, was not formally cleared by the CIA, 
but they had access to the agency through Casey's own personal elevator. One member of this inner circle was Max Hugel, who briefly served as the deputy director of the CIA before being implicated in questionable stock trading practices. Other notable members were John Shaheen, an oil trader who was involved in the October surprise affair, as well as Robert B. Anderson, a prominent figure in the Eisenhower administration who was ultimately disbarred for money laundering in the 1980s. Casey's most important associate was Bruce Rappaport, who had a history of complex and fraudulent business dealings, many of which involved intelligence-linked operations and were facilitated by a web of interconnected oil and shipping companies, banks, and numerous other holdings. Rappaport and Casey were sometimes partners in these endeavors, some of which predated Casey's time at the CIA. The two were also known to be golfing buddies and made frequent trips to the Long Island Deep Dell Golf Club. According to author Alan Block, Rappaport's chauffeur during these trips was sometimes Louis Filardo, who was suspected of being an associate of New York area mobsters. In the late 1980s, Rappaport became connected to Russian organized crime, including the boss of bosses amongst Russian crime syndicates, Semyon Moglevich. Moglevich was on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list and was described as a leader in international weapons trafficking, contract murders, extortion, drug trafficking, and prostitution. It's possible that Rappaport was initially introduced to Moglevich by Robert Maxwell, who had become a key business partner of Moglevich's and facilitated his entry into the Israeli and U.S. financial systems. Another associate of Moglevich's crime network was the aforementioned banker Edmund Safra, who was connected to both Maxwell and Rappaport. The background and early life of Rappaport is rather obscure. However, it is known that he was born in Haifa, Palestine in 1922 to a family that had immigrated from the Ukraine. He later obtained a law degree and served as a judge following the establishment of Israel. In addition, he was a member of the Israeli Defense Forces, where he held the rank of major. However, Rappaport's military experience dates back to before the formation of the State of Israel. He claimed to have served in the British Army during World War II and was possibly a member of the African Auxiliary Pioneer Corps, a logistic support unit that was later expanded to include combat operations. He may also have been a part of the Special Interrogation Group, a British commando unit that recruited heavily from the ranks of the Haganah, the Ergun, and the Special Night Squads. Following the war, Rappaport joined the 6th Airborne Division, a British Airborne Infantry Division that was stationed in Palestine. The division played a role in administering the territories and balancing the interests of Jewish and Arab factions in the region. During his time with the 6th Airborne, Rappaport helped organize the military police of the newly established State of Israel. Rappaport later became involved in the world of criminal enterprises and covert operations. A Scotland Yard report indicated that he and Teddy Kolick, who later became the mayor of Jerusalem, were involved in a scam related to construction materials in the early 1950s. Israeli newspapers also reported similar allegations, though sometimes it would be Paul Kolick, Teddy Kolick's brother, who was identified as Rappaport's partner. Regardless of which brother was actually involved, Rappaport's association with the Kolicks highlights his connections to the centers of power in Israel at the time. The connection between Rappaport and the Kolix also leads back to the Haganah, as well as the intermingling of intelligence and organized crime. Teddy Kolick, in particular, ran the day-to-day -day operations of arms procurement in New York for the Haganah in the 1940s, bringing him into contact with the criminal elements in the city. He maintained close connections to Al Schwimmer and Yehuda Razi, and would work with them to deliver aircraft to Israel through intermediaries in South America. British intelligence would take an active interest in Teddy Kolick due to his activities. On one hand, they treated him with suspicion and monitored his movements, including bugging his phones and searching his belongings. On the other hand, MI5 actively courted him, with Kolick's main contact being an MI5 officer named Simkin. This relationship was facilitated through a mutual friend, Ben Aharon, who was a Bolshevik and later became head of the Histadrut, a centralized body coordinating Israel's trade unions. Aharon's wife, Miriam, worked for the Shea, the intelligence apparatus of the Haganah. After his scam with one of the Kolik brothers was exposed, 
Rappaport was forced to flee Israel. Over the course of his lifetime, he would hold passports in Panama, Costa Rica, Israel, and Switzerland. Switzerland being where he would eventually settle down in the 1950s. Early support for Rappaport's Swiss ventures came from the Société Générale de Surveillance, as well as the Swiss-Israel Trade Bank, both based in Geneva. According to Rappaport, he was himself familiar with Swiss Israel's owner, who had provided him loans. Swiss Israel's original founder and owner, and likely the individual Rappaport was referring to, was Gideon Persky, the brother of aforementioned Shimon Perez, the leading Israeli Labor Party politician who would later serve as the president and prime minister of Israel. Shimon himself was a close friend of Robert Maxwell and his daughter, Isabel Maxwell. He was also a veteran of the Haganah, was appointed by David Ben-Gurion as the chief purchaser of munitions for Israel's military, and headed Israel's Ministry of Defense. According to authors Jonathan Nitzen and Shimshon Bickler, Shimon's control over defense spending greatly benefited his brother's businesses. Years later, Ehud Barak, who later served as Israel's defense minister and prime minister, claimed that Shimon Perez was the person who initially introduced him to Jeffrey Epstein. Swiss Israel's support for Rappaport is significant as it was effectively a front for the Mossad in Europe, with daily operations overseen by Yehuda Aja, who was on the Mossad payroll. The bank not only raised funds for itself, but also acted as a conduit for financing its international operations including the construction of nuclear reactors that played a major role in Israel's covert construction of nuclear weapons. According to Avner Cohen, management of the funds was conducted outside of the official state budget by David Ben-Gurion and Shimon Perez, who had also enlisted the aid of American Jewish fundraiser and businessman Abraham Feinberg to locate private donors for the project. Feinberg himself ran American Bank and Trust, a subsidiary of Swiss Israel. According to Jonathan Marshall, the connections between Swiss Israel, organized crime, and Paul Heliwell's hot money banking complex can be found here. Prior to his move to Geneva to lead Swiss Israel, Yehuda Aja spent World War II in Thailand, where he formed a relationship with General Fao Shrianan. As we discussed in Episode 1, Fao was connected to Paul Heliwell and played a role in American intelligence's involvement in the China-Burma-India opium trade. In 1960, Irving Davidson, a powerful lobbyist whose clients included the CIA, the Teamsters, Texas oil giant Clinton Murchison, and the State of Israel, reached out to Yehuda Aja regarding a Bahamanian bank called Guaranteed Trust Company. This bank was run by a significant supporter of Israel named Abe Moulter and was one of the offshore entities handling hot money from organized criminal activities, such as the skim from casinos and the Teamsters Pension Fund. The vice chairman of the bank was Leonard Burston, a former director of Miami National Bank, which had been established with the help of a loan from the Teamster Pension Fund and utilized the services of Paul Heliwell's law firm. With these early ties, and the establishment of International Maritime Services and International Maritime Supplies Company Limited in 1959, Rappaport's business ventures began to grow and interconnect with shipping and financial industries across the world. This growth was facilitated by partnerships with major maritime companies, including N.S. Frankenzoon of the Netherlands, American Maritime Supply Service in Chicago, and the Italian Maritime Supplies Company Limited. These alliances allowed Rappaport to gain access to a shipping client base of 161 firms worldwide. Rappaport also formed a strong lifelong connection with the Greek shipping family, the Kulakundis, in the early years of his business. Michael Kulakundis co-founded International Maritime Supplies, and court records indicate that Rappaport and Kulakundis were using the company to scam and exploit other businesses as early as 1961. Meanwhile, the Kulakundis family was advancing their own shipping interests through London and overseas freighters, which would later become a major player in the global oil trade. It is noteworthy that London and overseas freighters was established by the Kulakundis family in partnership with their cousins, the Mavrolion family. 
the Mavrolions were themselves connected to the circles around Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. For several years, Ghislaine Maxwell dated Gianfranco Chicogna, whose mother had been married to Basil Bluey Mavrolion, the family patriarch and original founder of London and Overseas. Contact information for Bluey Mavrolion and his son, Nicholas Mavrolion, Gianfranco's half-brother, can be found in Epstein's Black Book of Contacts. In 1965, Inner Maritime Bank, IMB, was established and would later become the center of Rappaport's intricate network of companies and financial channels. IMB had two classes of shareholders, Class A and Class B. The holders of Class B stock were representatives of financial institutions that had business relationships with Rappaport. These included the Klaus Jörg Polstra from Bank M. Van Ebden, and Rolando Zoppi from Vice Credit, a Swiss bank located near the Swiss-Italian border. Vice Credit would later be identified by the U.S. State Department as being used by Italian organized crime figures to hide their money from Italian authorities. Zoppi himself would be sentenced to five years in prison in 1975 after Vice Credit lost $150 million due to fraudulent and mismanaged high-risk operations. Another Class B shareholder was David Hodera from Solfgeist, a Swiss financial company that was later involved in the strange affairs of investors' overseas services, an international mutual fund with connections to Tibor Rosenbaum and Meyer Lansky. Class A stock was mostly held by Rappaport himself through various companies he owned or controlled. The remaining shares were held by E.P. Barry, an OSS veteran who was one of Paul Heliwell's key figures in Florida banking. In fact, Barry was involved with IMB Class A shares at the same time he was associated with HMT Florida shares, the holding company for some of Paul Heliwell's banks. Rappaport's connection to the world of Paul Heliwell can also be found in Burton Cantor, Heliwell's banking partner and an affiliate of organized crime. Burden Cancer became one of Rappaport's chief financial allies and was involved in many of his ventures. In 1988, the New York Times published an article about Bruce Rappaport entitled A Secret Emperor of Oil and Shipping, where his reputation for both secrecy and philanthropy were described. Some of his associates viewed him as a billionaire who sponsors sporting events and donates to numerous charities, particularly medical and Jewish organizations. On the other hand, former and current business associates claim that Rappaport was involved in hundreds of companies registered in places like Liberia and Panama, which he used to run his banking, shipping, and oil empire. Rappaport's presence in Liberia is of particular interest, as he established Inner Maritime Owners Corporation of Monrovia, another of his many Inner Maritime outfits. Liberia was a popular choice for shipping company owners due to its low tax rates, lax regulations, bank secrecy, and the flags of convenience system. Liberia's shipping registry also had unique characteristics, namely the fact that it was managed by International Bank in Washington, D.C., and its controller, George Olmsted, would later have connections to the BCCI affair. Rappaport wasn't the only figure connected to Liberia. Tibor Rosenbaum, for instance, was listed as the managing director of Swiss Liberian Finance Corporation in 1954, a corporation that provided a multi-million dollar line of credit to help capitalize the Bank of Liberia Incorporated, which was partially controlled by the Liberian government itself. Other capital inflows for the Bank of Liberia came from the Bank of Monrovia and the Liberian Trade and Development Corp. The Bank of Monrovia was previously owned by the Firestone Tire and Rubber Company and was later acquired by First National City Bank, which was controlled by the Rockefeller family. Liberian Trade and Development Corporation was controlled by a group of Italian banks. While attractive tax laws and the flags of convenience system played a significant role in attracting individuals and businesses to Liberia, the country was also known for its thriving diamond trade. In the 1950s, it had become a crucial transit point for diamonds sourced from Sierra Leone and other countries to cutting hubs, many of which were located in Antwerp and Israel. Bank Lumai, one of the largest banks in Israel, played a major role in financing the diamond cutting industry and had established offices and branches in Liberia. 
The board of Bank Lumai reportedly interlocked with that of the international credit bank ICB, which was owned by Tibor Rosenbaum. Rosenbaum, in turn, was affiliated with Kupat Am Bank, a subsidiary of Bank Lumai. Louis Mortimer Bloomfield, a Canadian attorney, served as the honorary counsel to Liberia during this time and had a vast network of connections to elite figures and institutions. He was a member of the Phillips and Weinberg Law Firm in Montreal, which was linked to the Royal Bank of Canada through its senior co-partner, Lazarus Phillips. In the Anatomy of Big Business by Libby and Frank Park, it was revealed that the Royal Bank of Canada was one of the leading institutions in Canada and served as a conduit for foreign capital from the US, UK, and Belgium. Phillips and Weinberg was also closely tied to the Bronfman family. While it has been alleged that Louis Bloomfield worked on behalf of the Bronfmans, there is limited evidence to confirm this claim. Nevertheless, Bloomfield's connections to a mysterious entity in Rome, which was linked to American, Italian, French, and Israeli intelligence networks, as well as international organized criminal actors and their banks, are well documented. In 1967, Gershon Perez, brother of the prominent Israeli politician Shimon Perez, joined the board of Centro Mondial Commercial, CMC, the Italian subsidiary of Permindex. Permindex was a World Trade Center organization that aimed to be a centralized location for business dealings and exhibitions, with offices located first in Basel and later in Rome. However, Permindex was not just a trade center. It had ties to various covert networks and individuals with questionable connections. New Orleans District Attorney Jim Garrison drew attention to Permindex as part of his investigation into the assassination of President John F. Kennedy after discovering that Clay Shaw, a suspected CIA contract agent, was on the board of the organization. Italian journalist Michel Meta found that Permindex CMC was connected to the Italian state security apparatus and had links to Israel. George Mandel, one of CMC's founders, was affiliated with the Basque Pour le Commerce Suisse Amérique Central, which was identified as having supplied cover employment for Israeli intelligence service agents. Louis Mortimer Bloomfield also played a crucial role in the complex network of CMC and its parent company, Permindex. He acted as the attorney for both organizations and was responsible for coordinating the various players involved in its operations. Despite being described as the founder or dominant shareholder of Permindex, there is no evidence to suggest that Bloomfield owned any stock in the company. Instead, it would seem that he acted as a proxy for undisclosed interests, holding the stock in his name and occupying board positions on their behalf. There have been long-standing rumors that Bloomfield was a member of the OSS during World War II, though there is little concrete evidence to support this claim. However, he did serve in the Royal Canadian Army Service Corps, achieving the rank of major in 1946. Bloomfield was also in communication with British spy master William Stevenson, who was active in Canadian industry and finance at the time. He was also a member of elite organizations such as the Most Venerable Order of the Hospital of St. John of Jerusalem, a British chivalric order established by royal charter in the 1880s as a Protestant counterpart to the Catholic Knights of Malta. He would eventually become the attorney and president of the order's Quebec Council. Bloomfield was also actively involved in several Zionist organizations and held prominent positions such as honorary counsel to the World Jewish Congress, and was an active member in building the Canadian branches of the Hisidru, Israel's trade union complex. He was also president of the Canadian wing of the Israel Maritime League, which was set up to promote the importance of maritime commerce for the people of Israel. The Israel Maritime League and the Hisidru were tightly connected. Along with the Jewish agency, the trio organized Zim Shipping, a major transport concern that was a key supplier of weapons and supplies to Israel during its early days as a state. Bloomfield also maintained lifelong interest in China, traveling there as early as 1966 and calling for the normalization of diplomatic relations and increased trade between the East and the West. Bloomfield corresponded with George H.W. Bush, 
including during Bush's tenure as the director of the Central Intelligence Agency, and the two men first met at a meeting at the Canadian Embassy in Beijing in 1975. Bush's presence here at the time is interesting because this was at a time when America and Red China did not hold any diplomatic ties to one another. Another prominent figure in Bloomfield's network was Tibor Rosenbaum. Permindex documents indicate that Rosenbaum and his international credit bank were closely tied to Permindex and CMC. Bloomfield and Rosenbaum corresponded about a related project, Marina Real, a holding company headed by CMC's founder, George Mandel, which was used by Permindex's principals to acquire real estate. Just as in Permindex, Bloomfield acted as a proxy for shareholders. Although the exact shareholders remain unknown, a memo between Mandel and Rosenbaum exposed some of the parties involved in Marina Real were Dov Biegen, a leading figure in the World Zionist Organization and National Committee for Labor Israel, who served in intelligence operations in France, Holland, and Norway in World War II. Also exposed was Nate Dolan of Cleveland, Ohio, who had connections to Realty Equities, a firm involved in a 1970 fraud scheme with Rosenbaum's ICB. According to Randall Cannon and Michael Gary in their 2018 book, Stardust International Raceway, Motorsports Meets the Mob in Vegas, Dolan had connections to mobster and Meyer Lansky affiliate Mo Dalitz, with the two both owning shares of the Cleveland Indian sports team. Bloomfield's law partner, Stanley Weinberg, was also closely monitoring Permindex CMC's real estate dealings, and perhaps even played a role that went beyond Bloomfield's. Communications found in Bloomfield's archive indicate that a French company, Compagnie Financière, held a 10% stake in one of the real estate ventures. Compagnie Financière was established in 1953 by Francois Perry and Edmond de Rothschild and is now known as the Edmund de Rothschild Group. Edmund Rothschild also had a close business partnership with Tibor Rosenbaum. The two had founded the Israel Corporation, Israel's largest investment company, which aimed to attract significant private investment in Israel. When it was revealed in 1974 that Rosenbaum had embezzled $60 million from the company, the Israeli government rallied several of the nation's leading banks, including Bank Lamai, to prevent its liquidation. This revelation prompted Dr. Simha Elric of the Likud opposition to exclaim in parliament in Jerusalem, are there no banks in Switzerland apart from the Mafia Bank? Edmund A. Rothschild's investments in Permindex CMC is evident in Lewis Bloomfield's correspondence. One cable from Bloomfield to Abraham Friedman at the Israel Continental Oil Corporation in Tel Aviv requested Friedman to discuss the Italian real estate deals with Rothschild. Notably, the Oil and Petroleum Yearbook lists Israel Continental Oil as being established in Canada in 1952, while Canadian government records indicate that Bernard Bloomfield, Louis Bloomfield's nephew, and a director of the well-discussed Atlas Bank, a subsidiary of International Credit Bank, served as the oil producer's president. According to the Jewish Telegraph Agency, one year after the formation of Israel Continental Oil, the company joined a consortium of oil companies seeking to drill in various locations in Israel, including near the Dead Sea. The other partners in this consortium were Husky Oil Company, which had ties to the aforementioned mob-linked Rimrock Tidelands Oil Company, as well as New Continental Oil Company, with which Israel Continental Oil established joint ventures in Canada. The president of New Continental, Frank Kaftel, was a Cleveland native, the home of mobster Mo Dalitz, as well as CMC investor Nate Dolan. Kaftel himself was a known organized crime associate and stock manipulator who was closely associated with Joseph Bayon Joe Ziccarelli, the mobster and businessman involved in trafficking arms to Israel. Another Canadian-based oil company active in the Israeli petroleum industry during the early 1960s was Tri-Continental Pipelines, where Edmund de Rothschild, Francois Puri, and Louis Bloomfield were all involved. As noted by Galina Nicotina in her Political and Economic History of Israel, Tri-Continental was part of a group that controlled a pipeline from Elat to Haifa, which was the basis for the larger Trans-Israel Pipeline connecting Israel and Iran. The group also included the Miami Group, which had ties to organized crime and was linked to the companies partnered with Israel Continental Oil, 
and Palestine Economic Corporation, which served as a primary conduit for American investment in Israeli industries. Palestine Economic Corporation assets totaled $19,300,000 in 1961. It has numerous daughter companies, banks, and agencies, and shares in other companies. Having grown to gigantic proportions, Peck has its tentacles in all the key branches of Israel's economy. Peck is linked with leading financial and industrial monopolies in the U.S., such as the Wall Street bankers Lehman Brothers, Kuhn, Loeb & Company, the Mellon Group of Pittsburgh, the Cabot Lodge Group of Boston, and the Hanna Group of Cleveland. This network of individuals and institutions formed a complex and intricate Israel-Italy-France-Canada axis, tied directly to hot money networks in the Caribbean and the flow of capital from the West into Israel, as well as the outflow of raw materials such as diamonds from the Third World. Once the foreign investment, primarily from American and Canadian sources, arrived in Israel, it was used to build up various industries. It appears that the efforts to raise money, supplies, and weapons for the Zionist paramilitary groups in mandatory Palestine had evolved into a focus on building up the capacities of the new state. In the case of Permandex CMC, its role as a World Trade Center would have been instrumental in facilitating international capital flows and business arrangements, while its links to intelligence services such as the CIA, Italian Special Services, and the Mossad suggest a covert aspect to its operations. Michel Mehta, in his book on Permindex, reveals that in the early 1960s, Israel and Italy entered into secret negotiations to support the French paramilitary group OAS in Algeria in exchange for Italian oil companies gaining access to Algerian crude oil. This arrangement was intimately connected to CMC and was led by former Italian Prime Minister Fernando Tembroni, whose son-in-law, Micucci Cecchi, was a board member of CMC. On the side of the OAS, the negotiations were reportedly handled by paramilitary leader Jacques Soustel. This connection became relevant during the investigation into the mysterious death of Enrico Matai when his plane exploded in October 1962. Enrico was the head of ENI, the dominant oil and gas firm in Italy that supplied petroleum to NATO and the U.S. 6th Fleet. In the early 1960s, Enrico had departed from traditional Cold War politics as he sought to sign oil agreements with the Soviet Union as well as Algerian and Egyptian interests who were openly opposed to Israel at the time. Theories suggesting his death was not accidental have existed for decades, leading to multiple official inquiries into the incident. During one of the official inquiries, Italian journalist Fulvio Bellini provided information that pointed to Jacques Soustel as the real culprit. He told judicial magistrate Vincenzo Calia to understand the death of Enrico Matai, you need to follow the trail of Jacques Soustel. This was the man given the job of doing Operation Matai with around $100,000 from Montreal through Permindex. So what then of the connection between Permindex CMC and organized crime networks? One possibility is that Permandex CMC was involved in money laundering activities through its connection with Tibor Rosenbaum's International Credit Bank. The Italo-American Hotel Corporation was identified as an affiliate of CMC in one of the earliest exposés of Permandex CMC by investigative journalist Mario Ugazi. Italo-American Hotel Corporation was dedicated to high-end real estate development, including the Hotel Duloc which was located next to ENI's headquarters. Michelle Meta highlights the close ties between the financing for the Italo-American Hotel Corporation and Banca Nazionale del Lavoro, a bank that had connections to infamous banks like BCCI and Banco Ambrosiano. BNL was also involved in the flow of weapons to Iraq in the 1980s. This funding came from multiple sources in Geneva and Liechtenstein, including the International Credit Bank, run by Tibor Rosenbaum. This raises questions about the ultimate origin of the money being used to finance Italo-American Hotel Corporation's high-end real estate development projects, including the Hotel Duloc in Rome next to ENI's headquarters. 
Given that ICB was moving the hot money being poured into its correspondent banks into the Caribbean, it is possible that via various companies, this money was being put into Italian real estate ventures. While such conclusions are speculative at best, it is a well-known fact that the wartime OSS and CIA, as well as Israel's intelligence services, operated in such close proximity as to become virtually indistinguishable from organized crime. And that takes us to the end of chapter three. Again, I'd just like to point out that I'm not telling you that all of these sources are 100% accurate, correct, or to be trusted. What I am saying is that there are nuggets of truth in everything. So please, as always, look at this with a critical eye, take what you think can be factually accurate, and build a narrative yourself. Make sure you guys check out Winnie Webb's work, go support her, buy her book, and don't forget to like, subscribe, and share the channel. Love you all. Looking forward to seeing you guys for episode four. Peace.